Well, welcome to our next installment of the Stepping Stone series. I am interviewing Dr. Jeff Mallins uh, today. And so, Jeff, why don't you sort of introduce yourself, generally say what your what your research is. Sure. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Mallins. I'm an assistant professor uh, in psychology at Georgia State. Uh, and I'm also affiliated with the Neuroscience Institute, uh, the Research for Challenges in Acquiring uh, Language and Literacy, uh, as well as the Trend Center. Um, and I uh, direct the GSU Language Organization Brain and Education, or GLOBE Lab. So it took some time to come up with a, that name. Uh, and we uh, look at questions related to reading and language development in different populations. So often uh, neuroimaging studies, looking at the brain networks that support uh, reading and language development uh, in, in children and also in adults, uh, and, and asking questions about how different experiences shape those networks. So for example, diverse mm -hmm. experiences with language and dual language learners or bilinguals, uh, also, um, educational experiences in the context of, of reading and language development uh, and ask questions really about um, with an eye towards the educational implications of those findings. So thinking about sort of if we learn something about the brain and how that supports reading and language, what does that ultimately mean for what happens in the classroom and how can we translate that scientific knowledge? Marvelous, marvelous. Well, tell us a bit about your history. How did you get into that? How did you decide to go for a PhD? What, what's your path been? So it's been a little windy, and I listened to, to your uh, interview recently as well, and so I'll say it, it follows some uh, similar lines as that, where I, I sort of have always followed what really interested me and, and sort of more was guided by, you know, is this an environment I want to be in? Or am I doing the kind of work I want to do? I, I, I wouldn't say that I had sort of a burning desire to become a professor necessarily. It was more that I was just really interested in learning and, and sort of as I got further along in the process, I just thought, you know, wow, I could really sort of in a, a job where I'm thinking and surrounded by all these interesting people asking interesting questions and and uh, that's really been sort of what's what's guided me and also the opportunity to actually contribute to knowledge and, and contribute to society. And and so I'll say that um, I'll go back to high school here and say that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, certainly I was highly interested in, in math and science um, and my teachers, you know, encouraged me to get into things like engineering. And I didn't really know what that was and <laughs> um, medicine. And I thought about that. and I'm like, I don't know if that's really for me. And you know, I, I, I applied to all sorts of different programs, but what I also had in addition to this sort of love of, of science and math was also a love of languages. So um, I grew up in Southern Ontario in Canada and, um, you know, took French in high school as, as one does, as we were actually required to do. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I think it's sort of a voices upon people and a lot of people didn't really like having to learn French. And I was sort of that one kid in the class who was just like, this is amazing. Like, I just ate it all up. And, and it wasn't, you know, I, sort of, I do love the French language and I'm really interested in the culture, but it was more, you know, just language itself, like just learning another language, thinking about another system and how that works. Uh, at the time, I didn't know that there was such thing as like a science of language. Like that was mm. a new concept to me that I learned later on. But I was really interested in French, and, and so I wanted to sort of continue with that as well. And I even applied to some programs in French as well as programs in science. Um, ultimately decided to do a program in biology because I love biology. I thought this would be a good way to kind of see what I like in this field and, and sort of, you know, try and take language classes along the way. So that's what I did. So um, I enrolled in a molecular biology and genetics program, which is actually what my undergrad is in. Um, wow. And I was squeamish about work with animals, <laughs> to be honest. And so I thought, I'll work with plants. Um, and I happened to go to the University of Guelph, which was a, a former agricultural college. Um, and so they had a very strong program in plant physiology and plant genetics and, and all of that. So that's actually what most of my undergrad courses were. We're in, we're in that area. <laughs> <laughs> um, you may win for the least related doctor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I did my honors thesis in plant agriculture, um, working with wine grapes and looking at some of the genetics that um, allow them to uh, essentially produce more tannins and be more red, which is an issue in Ontario with the short growing season. Um, you know, interesting, but not for me, as I learned sort of throughout that process. Um, and so, as I said, I had this sort of love of languages in the background, I was taking these French classes and I happened to take one called the structure of French. Mm. Um, and I actually emailed the professor about this years later because it is one of those classes that just changed my life, to be honest. It, it was like um, really eye-opening for me that there was a science to actually look at language to be able to dissect it into its components. Um, I'd never really heard of linguistics before that. I just fell in love with it. Um, and 
And at that point, you know, I learned a little bit about the, the results of this related field in psychology called psycholinguistics. And people were looking at like the brain and questions about language. And I was like, what? And, like you can use science to look at language? Like that was just a, a totally new thing for me. Um, so I actually, um, similar to your story, contacted the uh, professor of that psycholinguistics class. You know, I said, I've never taken psychology. Um, I, I only have this, you know, structure of French class. And would you be willing to let me into your course? And they did. And, and of course, you know, that I just fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. um, didn't entirely learn the lesson <laughs> um, because I sort of went forward, um, you know, got my honors thesis underway, um, applied to grad school, thinking that I was interested in sort of continuing on the research path, um, actually found a lab in plant uh, genetics to keep doing that kind of work, uh, wrote an uh, NSERC uh, fellowship um, proposal, which mm -hmm. is sort of like in Canada, kind of similar to NSF here, um, and happened to get it. So I was sort of set to like do grad school in this area. <laughs> um, and then did this honors thesis that I really didn't enjoy. <laughs> And and I'll say, you know, the, the lab was lovely, the advisor was great True. and very supportive of me, but it was just clear that That's I was not fit, suited yeah. to that kind of work. Um, and I thought, you know, I really don't like this. Like, I, I can't imagine going to do six more years of work in a lab like that. Like, and, um, and so I was sort of scrambling last minute um, and, you know, it was and this was at the point, this was after I'd graduated, it was May. I had this funding to go to grad school that I no longer wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was sort of scrambling to say, what, what can I do in this area? And I thought, you know, that's like a linguistics class that I took, like, maybe, maybe there's something in that. Um, and just was on a Google search and found this neuroscience program at the University of Western Ontario. Um, and it was like neuroscience or psychology and psychology needed the GRE. And I didn't do that because I didn't think I needed to. <laughs> so I went into neuroscience. That was honestly it. There were two advisors in language. I picked one. <laughs> I contacted wow. them. And I said, you know, I, I don't have a background in this. I do have this funding. Would you be willing to take me on? And, and he graciously <laughs> said, yeah, did. I think so. <laughs> yeah. And and I'm so glad he did. It, you know, is once I got there, I think I just really discovered a love for this field. And um, so that kind of, you know, I, I was in basically grad school and in neuroscience working in a psychology lab, having very little hmm. background in that, um, but sort of, you know, <laughs> got to where I needed to be and and uh, kind of continued on from there uh, in the field. And, and so I think it was sort of more just like listening to that intuition hmm. about like, you know, picking something that I was really interested in and that I sort of wanted to spend time doing. Yeah, we talk about fit, you know. But I think it really does come down to what, what fits for you and what works mm -hmm. for you and where your passion really can be. What a fascinating story. <laughs> I'm, I'm so thrilled. There's so, there's so many of us who have taken these windy mm -hmm. turns. Everybody says, oh, I've had a windy turn. But I think I think coming from plant genetics, yeah. <laughs> as far away as you as you can be. Um, so so tell me, what, what do you wish someone had told you in, in graduate school? I mean, what is something that might have helped you out if you'd known about it? Uh, so I'll say two things I think that that really helped me that I actually did hear that I was very grateful to have heard. Um, and the one was right towards the end. And and I'm someone who um, sort of likes to have all my ducks in a row. I, I, I like to have all these long term plans of exactly what's going to happen. Um, and, you know, I thought, OK, writing this dissertation like it's going, I'm just going to, you know, check the boxes. I have the schedule of what I need to finish each month and it's all going to happen. and It's going to be great. Um, and then it didn't happen like that at all. Like, and, and I, you know, even despite my best efforts was still scrambling to finish in those mm -hmm. last couple of months. And it was very stressful. Um, I remember coming home each day being like, I'm not going to graduate. It's not going to happen. Like, you know, even if I write as much as I wrote today, every day, I won't finish. <laughs> and of course that didn't happen. You know, I did figure it out and I got it done. But I remember days like that where I was just so concerned about like actually getting this thing done. And and that's very unlike me. And and I don't like being that kind of situation, which mm -hmm. is why I sort of do so much planning ahead of time to, to avoid that kind of thing. But um, what one of my mentors said to me is she said, you know what, like as much as you try <laughs> um, to sort of, you know, it ends up being a mad dash at the end and that's just it. And, and sort of to embrace that, um, which I thought was really helpful. Um, and the other thing, um, you know, sort of aside from that is also just that comfort with uncertainty that I think that mm -hmm. like, it, you know, finishing that PhD and sort of knowing that what came after, not knowing what came after, I, I knew that it was going to be a, a big change. I knew I was going to go on to do something else. I was thinking about doing a postdoc and, um, and an opportunity for one, you know, came to me and, and sort of just being open to that and, and mm. sort of allowing those opportunities to, 
um, to flourish, I, I think was like something I, I needed to work on and I've had to work on since of really just sort of embracing that and being excited about these opportunities as opposed to like, you know, again, sort of this need to have everything mapped out when it's really not maybe a career path that that allows that to happen necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not a career path for people who like things mapped out. I think that's that's very true. Was Would you say that was your biggest challenge? In, in doing absolutely. Yeah. It, it absolutely was. And I'll say, I think that that's, I think that's what it was. I honestly think I, I had a mental block of just not wanting to finish my PhD as much as I desperately mm -hmm. wanted to graduate, because at that point I was like, you know, ready to be done with this project. At the same time, I was like, I knew that it, it signaled an upcoming change for me. And, and, and I, I think that was just like something I wasn't quite mentally ready for. And I, I think it actually took getting a postdoc and sort of knowing that there was a date attached to it and like, okay, I have to move in October. Like <laughs> this is happening. Um, that then all the writing just happened that, that needed to happen. But I think it was, yeah, yeah. It, it really was just, again, that uncertainty and sort of have, once the plan was in place, I was really able to move forward. But, but I will also say that sort of along with that, that, um, you know, that it, it wasn't necessarily the academic work. It was the mm. sort of life, um, choices surrounding that so that, you know, I, as I said, I, I applied for postdoctoral fellowships. Um, there happened to be one that my advisor sent to me that was at Haskins Laboratories in New Haven, mm -hmm. Connecticut, um, which is where I ended up going, um, which, you know, is an amazing place to go. And, you know, sort of a lot of the science of, of speech and reading has, has come from there. It's got a, a big history to it. And um, and so he sent this to me and, and said, you know, you should strongly consider applying for this. It looks like it'd be really well suited to you. And and, you know, I'd never even heard of New Haven before, like, um, and, and, you know, it's, it's, you know, perhaps I'm not all that far away, but sort of the idea of moving to another country and, and, you know, I, I, I actually interviewed over Skype. Um, mm -hmm. And so when I moved to New Haven, like, um, my sister, you know, very kindly uh, came with me, her and I are very close, and then we actually lived together while I was in grad school. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, her and I actually packed up this truck and, and drove it across upstate New York and, you know, made our way to Connecticut and, um, and she dropped me off and then, you know, took the truck back to Canada. Um, and, you know, I was in New Haven by myself, didn't know a soul, had never been there. Um, That's not the most friendly city no. either. <laughs> and I, I figured it out, you know, I, 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 I sort of, you know, it took some time, but I, I, I was proud of sort of how I handled that, but it was um, in a hugely formative experience for me, I, I think to really do that independently. And mm -hmm. uh, I really think that sort of set the stage for, for what came after, but, but I'll say that sort of that, you know, that kind of for someone who again, <laughs> likes to know everything <laughs> um, sort of being thrown into that, um, I think was, was a big challenge for me. <laughs> Oh, unbelievable. But, and we all have those turning points, don't we? That sounds mm -hmm. like a, a big turning point, mm -hmm. a, a launching point for, mm -hmm. for, yeah. I always say I was 30 before I figured out what I wanted to do with my <laughs> life. <laughs> And we all have those points where it's like, oh, sometimes it's later, sometimes it's earlier, where mm -hmm. you can sort of make the decision um, of what it is that you're doing. So what was something that, that sort of kept you going? What would you say is something that really gave you encouragement either during your graduate work or in your early career? Uh, so I'll say like, uh, I think sort of personally and professionally, we'll start with personally, which, you know, I sort of credit a lot of it to my sister, as I mentioned, you know, mm -hmm. we're very close. We we lived together during grad school. She actually went to grad school as well in education mm -hmm. um, and happened to get a faculty position at the exact same time that I did. <laughs> um, so we're kind of going through this together and it, it's really nice to be able to sort of bounce off each other, sort of what we're going through and, and kind of the challenges in that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly I have a, a partner who is also very supportive and actually moved to Atlanta with me. And, and so that's been, you know, enormously helpful helpful. Um, and I'll say professionally, too, that I've certainly been very grateful to have many mentors along the way who've really um, supported me and given me a lot of good advice. Um, you know, so Mark Jonis at Western was the, the person mm -hmm. who took me on and, and was really excellent at sort of, you know, uh, giving me enough independence to sort of find my own way, <laughs> but also, you know, being there um, when I needed it. And, and I mm -hmm. feel like that grad school experience, I think, was so critical for me that, like, because I was sort of taking that on and was kind of new to it and, and sort of that yeah. um, really uh, just, I think, just went the best way that it could have. And, and so that's mm -hmm. um, certainly, you know, set me up um, and, and definitely afterwards at, at Haskins and at Yale as well. And in here at Georgia State, I've been really fortunate to have uh, people who have really helped guide me. And I think that that's 
so important to have people to turn to, to, you know, when you have challenges and yeah. um, to have that kind of relationship where, where you feel comfortable with that. Almost just someone you can vent to in many mm-hmm. ways, I know, is, mm-hmm. is really important as you're going through challenging times, like getting a PhD and getting mm-hmm. started. Uh, and a team, I think you're right, a team of mm-hmm. mentors, you know, people that you who, whose advice you trust um, is just so, so important. Um, so a, a quick, you know, the question we're asking everybody, uh, and you probably have a few of these, is, you know, <laughs> what was something that everybody else in the lab seemed to understand when you got there and you really had to wrap your head around? It was really a challenge for you. You know, we've all had something where you walk into the lab and everybody else seems to understand what's going on and there's one or two terms or you're just like i this is for a foreign language you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) to me what would you say did you have that experience what would you say there so i have a few i I would say like the first one is just generally like being in a psychology lab Mm. never having taken psychology and having to ta psychology again never having taken it you know i'm having to teach these things that I I didn't know and trying to stay one step ahead of the students. And and so that was, you know, definitely a challenge over all sorts of psychology terms being thrown around that I had to sort of pick up along the way. Mm. Um, As far as the linguistics, there's one, um, so there's a distinction between phonetics and phonology. Mm. Um, And to be honest, I still don't entirely know what that is. I'm embarrassed to say I I probably should at this point, but, um, you know, in in linguistics, you know, that's that's an important distinction. And especially when I got to Haskins, which is sort of like the science of speech had come from there. Um, I remember a, a colleague, she was actually talking about someone else and was basically saying like, you know, can you believe that they don't know the difference between phonology and phonetics? And I was like, yeah, like, wow. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, I don't know what that is. And, you know, I, I have friends who have careers in phonetics. And, and, and to be honest, I still, I, it's a term I struggle with in terms of that distinction. So I'll say that that's one that um, sort of, I, I'm embarrassed that I don't know better. It's an aspirational goal. <laughs> yes, <that>. exactly. <laughs> You now you know some students gonna stump you now in your introductory <laughs> linguistics class. Exactly. Oh my goodness, that that is fun. That is fun. So, what would you say would be the strongest sort of characteristic that you would recommend for someone who wanted to go on in a field like yours, whether you think of it as psycholinguistics mm-hmm. or literacy or or what have you? What would you what would you think somebody should really try to have or develop? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. I, I think that um, I think a lot of it is is sort of from the side of the actual sort of research questions and what they're yeah. asking. So I think, you know, for me, it really came from a love of language and a curiosity about its structure and how the brain sort of works to support that. Um, and I got in from there sort of questions about um, sort of reading and language acquisition and some you know individuals who have challenges with that, working with children with reading disabilities, for example. Uh, and so I find that often in this area, like sort of that a lot of it, the passion sort of comes from, you know, working with children and sort of observing some of the struggles and, and seeing just how complex language and reading really are. And sort of, you know, the, I think that really helps inform questions about the brain. And, and, mm-hmm. and as I said, I think that sort of piece of bringing that, that back to the classroom that I think it's so important to have conversations with teachers and actually like, you know, what are you doing? What are you observing? And, and you know, trying to make that link because I think sort of as someone who spends most of my time in the laboratory that mm-hmm. I can become disconnected from what's actually happening in the classroom. And so like, you know, if we find like, okay, the inferior frontal gyrus does this really important thing for reading. They're like, great. Like, who cares? Like, you know, how's it actually gonna <laughs> help me help a child who's struggling? Mm-hmm. And so I think that, you know, really thinking about those pieces and and spending time having conversations with individuals uh, is really, really critical. Oh, the translational aspect, the integration across application as well as discovery. Marvelous. Well, let's end that there then. (laughs) Thank you so much. Uh, And this has been Dr. Dr. Malins. Uh, And uh, we'll, we'll just end it right here. Thank you.